Okay, uh, this is a little video I want to talk about the concept of strain energy. Um, so a lot of times I skip this in class, but uh, it actually is kind of important topic. It's not terribly difficult, so uh, I want to talk about it a little bit. And the nice thing about it is it also allows me to introduce this analogy between um, springs and elastic materials. So for physics one, remember if we have a spring, coil spring, a spring has a certain spring constant, K, and what that does is it relates the force that's applied to how much the spring stretches. Right? The spring stretches a certain amount. And you apply the force, we'll call that stretch. Yes, right? Yes, it's about the spring stretch. So the spring stiffness uh, equals um, the force over the stretch. So it's in units of force per length, right? Force per displacement. See this, if it's a linear spring, we can plot force and then displacement on the x-axis. Slope of the curve. Is spring constant. Now that's a linear spring, that's supposed to go forward. Uh, it's constant, K is constant. You can also have springs that are nonlinear. Like softening, or it could curve up, in which case they're hardening. And in this case, the spring constant is really a function of. Now, the energy associated with the spring, right? So you take this spring, put a force on it, it moves. So the force moves, so there's an amount of work associated with that, right? So work done by the spring, force that does, acts on the spring, is going to be the force times the distance. Or, a more rigorous way of doing it is it's the integral of the force over the displacement. So it's the integral of the force uh, on the displacement. Okay, so that, that, this works for both the nonlinear and the linear springs. All right? So if you look at that, right, that is just the area under the curve, right? The area under that curve. Right? You go to this point, S star or whatever. The amount of energy to stretch S star area under this curve, right? We all remember that, right? So the energy, the work done, the energy is the area under the um, force displacement curve, whether it's linear or not, right? If it's linear, in this case, we know that it's uh, linear. Right? It's a linear spring. We know that the force is always equal to A, S. Right. If I put that in there, then work of the spring becomes the integral of K, S, D, S. K is a constant, I can pull it out of the integral, so I can exactly integrate this. This becomes one half K, S squared, right? Which is the area on the Total work done by a linear spring. If it's a nonlinear spring, you actually have to do it. Right? But for most of the time, it's okay. Now, <clears throat> if you think about a spring, <coughs> it's directly analogous to uh, elasticity. So instead of this spring 
recovery step up. Imagine you have a bar, a certain cross sectional area, and it also has a young modulus E. Put on here some force P, and it will stretch. S. You know, I know what we call it delta or D or something like that, but just to keep the symbols the same, S. Right? The reason I do that is so like that. DD. Alright, so it looks just like a spring. Alright, and if you want to carry this a little further, right? Um, force P is equal to stress times the cross sectional area and the displacement S is the strain times the original length. Okay? That's just from strain and it looks small. Okay? Well not I'm sorry, not the not small definition of stress. The definition of stress and the definition of strain. Okay. Um, so if we look at this, and, and you can see that, right, when we look at these material spots, a lot of times we look at stress, strain plot, right? And you can see that, like, now this is from the spring, but the stress is the force of the area, and this is the stretch, right? So you can see actually the shape. Basically the same, right? They have the same effect, it's just these have been normalized by the cross sectional area of the light to make them intrinsic properties, characteristics of just the material. And this slope again would be the Okay. Well, still, the amount of work done to stretch this bar. Well, first let's go through this one. So we're going to look at the spring constant for such a material. Let's say the spring constant for the bar still is going to be defined as the uh, force over the elongation. Now in this case, the force is going to be stress elongations. So that would give you the spring constant, but you can see this sort of stress and strain. So let's get rid of those. We know that the stress over the strength is actually equal to equal to Young's modulus, right? So this can be replaced by Young's modulus. Now we got something just in terms of the properties of the bar. The spring stiffness of the bar is E times A times the original. Actually, I always think when I say it by hand, it's like A, E, I know. The way it worked out. That's, that's the bar material. Basically, can act like a spring. You can design a spring. Here's the stiffness. It still has units of force per length, but right, it involves cross sectional area, Young's modulus, and the original length. Okay? So, obviously, as Young's modulus goes up, the spring stiffness goes up. If it becomes a, a bigger cross sectional area, again, the spring constant goes up. That makes sense. And if it's longer, the spring constant goes down, right? As you take a, 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 a long bar, you know, it's, it's more compliant than a shorter bar, where you get the same, okay? So that's sort of the analog between a spring and an elastic bar, right? Okay, well, let's look at the work. So still, the work stretch this bar. It's the same. So we can use the analogy or you can go through it's 
building you know, force kind of integrated over the elongation, or we just go right with the analogy. You know that this is the work is still the spring stiffness times the elongation squared. Now let's do let's do it in terms of this. So it's still going to be the integral of the force over the elongation, right? It's, it's still just work, it's the same thing. Now let's get this in terms of material properties and stresses and strains. So P, I'm going to write as stress times the cross-sectional area, right? That's P. Now S. Strain times the original length. So, in other words, we can take the differential. So, ds, well, the length is just a constant, so it's times difference in the strain, ds, right? That's the differential. We take this, put it here, put that, put it there. Now we get the work done to stretch this elastic bar. Integral of sigma times a times l times epsilon. Okay? That's the total work to stretch the last one. Now, if you look at this, a cross sectional area times the length, right? The cross sectional area of the bar times its length is nothing more than the volume of that bar. Those are constant, okay? So I can pull that out of the interval. That's not a function of the strain, right? Uh, the original length and the original cross-sectional area, they are constant. So they come out of the interval. The work to stretch the elastic bar is, uh, let's call it V, right? That's the volume of the material times the interval of stress differential strain. All right. Now, what we normally see, so here we have a relationship between energy to stretch bar, volume, and stress strain. Okay. Normally, we divide by volume. So we get, in fact, the work to stretch the bar, which is energy, divided by the volume. So that's energy per volume equal to the integral of the stress of the strain of the strain. Okay. This quantity here what we call strain energy. Okay, that's strain energy. It's usually given the symbol of U. Okay. It's got units of work per volume. Okay. So what this is saying, just like when we talk about the work to extend a spring that has actually units of work. When we talk about stretching an elastic material, there's actually a strain per volume of material. I'm sorry, an energy per volume of material. That's the strain Work or force or distance over volume. Distance cubed. So that's just force. Okay, so you can see again, it actually has units of stress. Right? Now that kind of makes sense because now if we look at this, what we're saying is strain energy is just the integral of the stress of the strain curve. So again, same concept. Strain energy is the area under stress strain. Okay? So if we take a bar, stretch it up to a certain point or any elastic material, stretch it up to some point given by the strain star, figure out the strain energy area under the curve. Right? Again, same thing you can put in here for elastic material. So I, I should say this holds for Inelastic, inelastic material. If we have elastic material, I can write the strain.
stress as those modulus times the strain. Now I can perform the interval. This becomes a linear material, a linear elastic material. Form the integral and then become one and a half. Strain time. Or in other words, you can take one of these strains and multiply by the other. Again, it's the area of the cup, right? Here's the stress, here's the strain, and we have stress to the strain. Okay. All right, so those are the equations. The derivation is kind of nice, whatever, but I think the easiest way to remember this is we all know that the work for a spring is the area under the force displacement curve. Okay, that's actually units of work. But since when we're, when we're talking about elasticity, we talk about these sort of intrinsic stress and strain, area under the curve is work per volume. That's the strain energy. So the strain energy is the area under the stress strain. It does not actually involve geometry of the ball. Purely a function of the right? So strain energy is actually quite a useful concept. And just like a lot of times you can solve dynamics problems and whatnot with energy assumptions, you can solve elasticity and energy relationships as well, and avoid some vector, vector issues.